Okay, well, hello everyone, and welcome to this year's Open Access Week. Um, brief housekeeping first, these talks are going to be recorded and made openly available online afterwards. So please turn off your microphone, obviously, and your camera, um, and add your questions to the chat window, and we can ask those of the speaker at the end of the session. Uh, we'll aim to finish up just before the hour for those heading off to the follow-up workshop, and I'll stick the link in the chat for the Eventbrite uh, link to sign up to that for those who haven't but want to. Um, and I'd quickly like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land that I'm on today, in my case, the lands of the Rwandri people of the Kulin Nation, and I'd encourage you to all think about whose land you're currently situated on. And I'd like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and extend that respect to any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islanders who are uh, present here today. Now, before introducing the speaker, I'll quickly hand over to Martin Borchert, who is the chair of the Australasian Open Access Strategy Group and university librarian at Uni New South Wales, uh, just to say a few words. Thank you very much, Thomas, and uh, good morning, everybody, and welcome from me too. The theme of this year's International Open Access Week is Open with Purpose, a Taking Action to Build Structural Equity and Inclusion. This year, the Australasian Open Access Strategy Group has uh, collaborated with a group of open access of practitioners from the AOSG membership. I'd like to thank Emma McLean here at UNSW, Katia Henry, QUT, and uh, Luckman Hayes, AUT, and uh, Mary uh, Filsel uh, from Flinders, and also you, Thomas, from La Trobe, who have worked with AOSG staff, who include Sandra Fry and you, Ginny, thank you, Ginny Barber, to develop a program of 10 events across the week which of course starts with this one today. This program brings together open access research of practices, example, an example including our preprints today, also open data and open licenses with broader principles such as infrastructure and the science of communication. And the presenters, panels and workshops also aim to bring a broader representation of voices, to look at structural equity and inclusion, also from our perspectives, including the citizen scientists and indigenous researchers and specialists. We have also a specially recorded interview on our AOSG website from Professor Peter Doherty, who is a Nobel Laureate, who will uh, discuss also like a scholarly publishing and open access. So we really hope you enjoy the events and will engage with the discussions online uh, during the week and afterwards. And uh, thank you. I'll hand back to you, Thomas. Thanks very much. So fittingly, uh, starting off this open access week, we're going to have a discussion of preprints um, and our speaker today is Jessica Polka, who is kindly joining us on her Sunday over from the United States. Um, and she's got a background in biochemistry and cellular biology, um, but she's talking from her point of view as one of the co-founders of ASAP, uh, ASAP Bio and its current executive director. Um, and this is a really interesting researcher-led nonprofit that focuses on um, innovating life sciences publishing in particular, but of course a lot of these ideas have much broader uh, impact and scope than just life sciences. So I'm very happy to now turn over to Jessica. Thank you so much, Thomas. I really appreciate the introduction. It's uh, a delight to be here today to talk to you about preprints uh, and their interaction with uh, open access and open practices in general. So just a brief overview of what I would like to cover today. First, uh, I'll speak a little bit about what preprints are and why they're used. I think this will probably be territory that's very familiar to those of you in the audience who may be posting, reviewing, citing preprints yourself. Uh, but I'll also highlight some of the current situations, both policies from funders and also COVID-19 and the role that preprints are playing there. 
Um, I'll then transition into practical considerations that you might take when posting a preprint. Um, and also, this includes peer review of preprints and feedback on preprints. And finally, I'd like to speculate a little bit about what the future might hold for preprints and how they could be used to broaden access to science and accelerate discovery. So Thomas already provided a little bit of information in my background, but just as a uh, to reiterate, I am coming from a perspective of um, life sciences and definitely bring that bias uh, in, into this. Um, I, uh, you know, also um, an open access advocate and, um, you know, also thinking you know, about the research enterprise from the perspective of uh, early career researchers. But, you know, as Thomas mentioned, ASAP Bio is a small nonprofit organization that works to try to catalyze culture change by holding convenings around issues like preprinting and open peer review. And it really got started in 2015 when Ron Vale, our founder, um, did a study of the time it takes graduate students in his program to come out with a first author publication. And he found that over the past 30 years, this time to publication had increased by a year. So this means, of course, that you know, since research is built upon existing knowledge, the longer it takes for research to enter into the public sphere, the longer it takes for that work to catalyze and develop new knowledge. And so we're actually, even though we have so much technology for rapidly communicating, for sharing uh, information quickly with one another, the actual process of formal publication is getting slower over time, and that is causing discovery and science to slow down as well. So preprints, as I'm sure many of you know, are a mechanism to make scientific manuscripts available almost immediately under the control of authors. So when authors feel that they're ready to share a manuscript, which you know, in the life sciences is typically, um, it's often considered the same manuscript that is submitted to a journal. Um, it can be posted after a screening process. Uh, you know, I think this less than 48 hours is definitely flexible at different servers and certainly under the constraints of COVID-19. I know this uh, has occasionally been longer at some times, but the point being that there is a brief screening process. The manuscript is available online where it is accessible for feedback and discussion. And this can often be months or perhaps even years prior to the time when the final journal version is published. So, you know, preprints not only accelerate the process of communication, but they really enable a new way of interacting with research that is, that is written up as an article. Instead of interacting with an article that is a version of record that is set in stone, it's very unlikely or heavily stigmatized if it does change. Um, a preprint is much more of an invitation for a conversation uh, that can help to improve the manuscript overall. And I should say that because of the way that preprints are used in the life sciences, and also because of the policies of some journals and servers, which I will get back to uh, later, preprints are not equivalent to the author's accepted manuscript or the version of record. And oftentimes, uh, we can discuss this a little bit later as well, um, peer review does uh, really change manuscripts. It can uh, tone down claims, it can improve uh, papers and find errors. And so um, I think since it's Open Access Week, I'd just like to highlight that um, preprints are not the same uh, as that version that is ultimately posted. And so I think there's really a role for both um, for both the, the open access final version and the preprint. Okay, so how are preprints working in the life sciences? So these are data from Europe PNC, which has been indexing preprints uh, and comparing their date of availability to when the journal version was, was posted. And they find a median of four to five months between preprint posting, or rather the first version of preprint posting because preprints can be updated uh, to include additional versions. And uh, the uh, posting of the journal version. So clearly this is a lot of time saved in terms of allowing potential collaborators to become aware of work, 
to spark discussions, etc. But the acceleration is not the only benefit of preprinting. So this was a survey conducted by Cold Spring Harbor about BioArchive and posted on BioArchive. And I should say that I do have a tiny URL of the slides uh, so that you can follow these links uh, if you'd like to. Uh, I'll post it into the chat. But um, the researchers surveyed by this survey are authors at BioArchive. And the uh, majority of them said that preprinting had helped them increase awareness of their research. And there's other benefits as well, meeting new people, staking a priority claim, initiate collaborations, et cetera, et cetera. So really there's a lot of perceived benefits of visibility. And you know, certainly I can say that from my own experiences, preprinting during the postdoc is also the case. But perhaps then it's no surprise that preprinting has been on a kind of exponential growth trajectory in the life sciences over the past few years. Uh, right now, uh, especially with the increase in the rapid growth of MedArchive here in pink during the last few months, um, and the emergence of other servers that are closely tied with publishers, um, the volume of manuscripts posted every month to these preprint servers is about 8% of the volume of manuscripts posted on PubMed. So we're really making a lot of, seeing a lot of impact, and a lot of science being shared in this way. And this acceleration has been supported by funder policies that have recognized preprints as valid communication tools. So um, I believe the Simons Foundation was the first uh, that I'm aware of in the life sciences to formally recognize that preprints could be cited as evidence of productivity in a grant application or a report. But many other funders followed suit um, and Crossref uh, indexed preprints or rather provided a way for preprints to receive a DOI, which enabled them to be uh, integrated with a lot of different infrastructure tools. And most recently, um, preprints are appearing in a full text form uh, on your PMC, and they're also indexed in PubMed as well. So we do maintain a list of funder policies and uh, university policies about preprints. And if you know of others, I would love to update and expand them. So coming back to the issue of COVID-19, especially early in the pandemic, a large number of articles were released as preprints. Uh, and these spanned a variety of different servers, uh, MedArchive, SSRN, uh, and others. And importantly, it's not only biomedical preprints, but also in social sciences and, and so forth. So these data are from a project uh, that I've been working on with some co-authors uh, to look at the um, exposure of preprints in social media and the media, which I think have really come into the public awareness and into the awareness of many researchers in fields who did not previously use preprints um, in a way that I think is quite unique. So we've seen a lot of public uh, media coverage of, of preprints and, and you know, really coverage of not only preprints themselves, but also how preprints are impacting science. Uh, we looked in this project that I mentioned at the attention on preprints uh, and found really a like, large increase in both the number of views and the PDF downloads, as well as citations, tweets, news articles, et cetera. For COVID-19 preprints, over the baseline of non-COVID-19 related preprints on BioArchive and MedArchive. So, you know, I think that the, the audience for preprints is growing. And, you know, I think that oftentimes people think about preprints as a way of communicating to other researchers in their own field. But depending on the subject matter, there's also the opportunity for communication uh, to broader audiences as, as well. In a survey that ASAP Bio and attendees of a workshop that we organized um, earlier this year organized, we, we found that, um, I'll just highlight the, the concerns. 
there, the, the top concern of survey respondents, which were primarily researchers, was the issue of what is perceived to be premature media coverage of preprints. So I think that there's quite a lot of anxiety, uh, which, which makes sense about the coverage of preprints or the, um, the representation of preprints in, in journalism or really on social media as well. Questions about whether it's clear uh, how these manuscripts have been or have not been peer reviewed, how that fits into the general process of science um, and the potential for um, perhaps the perpetuation of information that might get corrected during peer review. Uh, I should say that a lot of these concerns, of course, are also, also issues with uh, journal articles, which can uh, you know, be shown to be um, incorrect or be modified or nuanced over time as well. Um, but certainly the fact that posting preprints um, is something that's very easy to do relative to going through this um, peer review process uh, kind of heightens some of these, these fears. So, you know, I want to highlight, for example, um, this preprint, which was, you know, talked about a lot on social media as a problematic um, preprint where there was a discovery of, or I should say, <laughs> alleged similarity uh, between um, COVID-19 and HIV. Um, on one hand, I think that this, this highlights the fact that um, you know, the screening process for preprints is by necessity more lightweight than a peer review process, but that the uh, way that preprinting allows comments from the community provides a type of uh, overlay of critique that can help to correct problems rapidly. So this preprint was posted, I believe, on a Friday, and less than 48 hours later, it had received dozens of comments and was withdrawn by the authors. So on one hand, um, you know, I think that this shows to the public the progress uh, and the process of science as a mechanism that can ideally, with uh, appropriate broad community input, self-correct itself over time. So preprints enable errors to be found and corrected much more rapidly than they would be if this paper had been hidden from the public eye for months and then finally um, released and uh, perhaps going through a lengthy process of retraction or correction at a journal. So this, this fast turnaround time, I think, is something that can um, demonstrate the value of community feedback on preprints. So we have a project now uh, called Preprints in the Public Eye. We invite participation um, you know, from researchers, from represent representatives of institutions. We're looking at the best practices for labeling preprints um, and uh, how to explain the, sort of the process of peer review to non-specialist audiences um, and you know, resources to enable uh, coverage of preprints in, in a more um, uh, informed way. But I think that um, the as COVID-19 is uh, increasing awareness of preprints. I think there is greater attention uh, on how we can use preprinting to communicate within scientific communities as well. So um, we have a list of suggested steps to take uh, if you decide to preprint. And I wanna run through those now as a way of introducing some considerations and questions that you might wanna take into account uh, should you decide to share your research this way. So number one, I think it's very important to check journal policies. Um, in the biomedical sciences, journals now are uh, very, very supportive of preprints. But it is important to not only verify this, but also understand the nuances of each journal policy. So for example, I just want to highlight Sugar Romeo. It's a great database that allows you to check what the policies are about posting the submitted version. So um, I, you know, I think, again, this gets back to the 
um, concept that uh, many people are equating a preprint or the first version of a preprint with the submitted version. Uh, but this is a great way to compare or to take a look rapidly at a variety of different journals. But I think it's also very important to go and look at the journal policies themselves. Um, there is a lot of um, nuance in the way that these policies are expressed. For example, uh, some journals have different uh, ways of describing the type of servers that are allowed. Uh, for example, some say non-commercial servers, um, some reference community servers, some name servers, um, and I'll in, later in the talk provide a, a way of kind of helping to disambiguate some of these terms. But the point remains that, um, especially if you're considering multiple different journals, it can be helpful to understand where the policies overlap and, and don't. Another issue is when preprints can be posted or more specifically, what version of preprints can be posted. So for example, Nature Research has a policy that preprints can be posted at any time during the peer review process, whereas Cell Press says that they don't support uh, posting revisions that respond to editorial input and peer review. So this, I think, kind of reinforces the idea of the preprint as a submitted version and um, you know, really prevents any improvements that could be incorporated into the manuscript throughout peer review, whether that's from the journal process or from feedback on the preprint or from just circulating the manuscript to colleagues. Um, you know, I think that this type of policy um, really prevents preprints from becoming equivalent to uh, providing full open access of what we consider the final version. So we have been involved in a project that uh, seeks to clarify the version of preprints that can be posted in database form. Um, so I think that this is another resource, but I would highlight the fact that it's very important, I think, to look directly at the journal page itself uh, when you're getting close to submission. So next, if you have a journal in mind, it's also important to select a server. So there are many, many preprint servers around. This is just a small subset. And in the life sciences, there's actually 44 that are relevant. We surveyed them um, and conducted an analysis of the landscape, which is quite significant. Uh, I won't go through all the details here, but just to say that there is a lot of sort of multidisciplinary platforms, more disciplinary platforms um, as well, and different types of ownership both nonprofit organizations, commercial organizations, uh, et cetera. So we have summarized uh, this information in a uh, basically a table on our site. You can um, highlight different fields. You can expand the records to, to take a look. And we're in the process now of uh, permitting updates to this table as well. So this, I think, can help identify some of the, the questions about who owns a preprint server, et cetera. Number three, choosing your license. Um, I think <laughs> licenses are a topic that I'm sure this won't be the, the you know, uh, last time you mentioned during Open Access Week. It's an incredibly important topic that I think can be a little bit um, uh, intimidating. Um, I, I, I think I was talking to a, a colleague once and he was like, oh, uh, licenses, you mean that alphabet soup stuff? Um, yeah, I think it, 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 the alphabet soup has an incredibly important implications for how science can be reused, especially as we're moving into an era where um, extraction of entities, annotation, um, redisplaying re preprints will provide new functionality. Choosing a license can have really major implications. So I think that, that there has been a, a conflation of the, the idea of free with the idea of open. But in the original sort of definitions of open access, open access is not just free to read, but also uh, that there's a freedom to reuse the, 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 the material. So for example, on PubMed Central, only a fraction of the papers that you can um, see for free online are actually able to be downloaded and reused. 
And you know, even though the licensing choice is in the hands of individual researchers on BioArchive, um, this is an analysis from uh, Daniel Hummelstein, which is a few years old at this point, but um, we're seeing similar patterns when we look at the COVID-19 uh, papers in the in analysis I showed earlier. That the majority of preprints um, on BioArchive are licensed um, with relatively restrictive licenses. So up here in this light color, uh, CC BY is um, one of the more uh, permissive licenses, whereas more of the content is, uh, is some of which has no license at all. So why, um, you know, why does this matter? Um, how do you go about understanding these licenses and, and making these choices? Um, we have some resources on our site that are, have been uh, developed in collaboration with Creative Commons and PLOS and representatives from other organizations um, that seeks to explain what the licenses mean, specifically what they can actually do for your preprint, like what, what is the implication of choosing and applying some of these terms uh, onto your license. And, you know, for example, um, you know, what is the difference between choosing the CC0 waiver versus, you know, no license? Um, and we've also gone through a lot of details about how uh, choosing a license impacts, you know, copyright transfer, et cetera, et cetera, or not, as the case may be. So uh, please do check it out. And, you know, I think that, um, yeah, here, the major funder in the U.S. encourages the use of uh, CC BY licenses, you know, because open science is really fully enabled by having content that can be built upon and reused in, in a positive way. So let's say that you know which journal you'd like to submit to if you'd like to submit to a journal, you know, which, license, which server, server you want to, uh, to post on you know um, yeah, what kind of license you might want to use, it's time to have conversations with your co-authors and ensure that they're on board. And this, uh, I feel like there's not enough time to really talk about this issue. Um, but just to say that this can be a really you know, complicated issue, especially with power dynamics um, of a, you know, a student talking to their PI, talking with collaborators, um, and, you know, it's an issue that I think is probably best uh, taken over um, a, uh, you know, an individual level. But I think that two kind of things that are helpful is to find people who are pre-printing in your field, um, demonstrate that this is working for your own peers, and also to have conversations about pre-prints throughout the rest of your research life. So for example, covering them in journal clubs um, is one way of kind of introducing and really demonstrating the benefits of preprints in a more indirect way. So uh, just to highlight, we have a variety of resources on our site um, that can be helpful in, in this process, including answers to some frequently asked questions um, about preprints as well. So uh, I think next, as you're moving towards uh, submission, it's important to upload code, data, or deposit reagents. Um, I think that there is a little bit of controversy now over what the norms are in a certain field for making this type of uh, research product available as, uh, as you are, <coughs> excuse me, um, preprinting. Um, there's no enforcement, as far as I know, um, about at the deposit of code or data at many servers. Um, but revealing this information can provide a complete description of your scientific process and uh, support open science as well. I just want to highlight that BioArchive has this really nice interface for finding the data and code associated with a preprint if you do specify that as you're submitting. And OSF has this very um, strong position where they require a statement about the availability of public data. And if it is available, uh, links 
out as well. So there are, I think, proven servers that are taking strong stances. Um, we uh, discussed this further in a meeting report uh, for how to kind of enhance trust and preprints through the uh, use of, of robust metadata. So, you know, this is not really a step so much as, as a, you know, an opportunity for celebration, but I think one, one thing that's very important to do with preprints, because there's not a journal that is sending out a table of, you know, of contents to a very niche group of, of subscribers, certainly BioArchive and MedArchive do um, kind of uh, disseminate the results, but I think it is important to request feedback and let people know about your preprint. Um, so this again is from that great bioarchive survey. Um, a significant fraction, over 40% of preprint authors reported getting some feedback on Twitter. Interestingly enough, um, this is much more widespread than the bioarchive commenting section. Um, and you know, just as an inspirational example, um, Daniel Quintana posted in a Facebook group about a uh, paper that he had posted on OSF. There was a really elaborate conversation that happened and this individual actually became a co-author on the new version of the preprint. So this kind of feedback is certainly possible and it's not just restricted to the comment section. Especially in light of COVID-19, funders and publishers have been calling for um, more commentary and feedback on preprints. Um, so for example, there's this coalition that was encouraging um, the review of preprints as a way to kind of it, both inform readers and also feed forward into a journal process. So there's many different ways of commenting on preprints. We have uh, endeavored to catalog a variety of different peer review experiments. Uh, at the site reimagine review, but I'll just highlight now a few that are involved in COVID-19. Um, outbreak science is, uh, you know, especially given the theme of open access week, something that I want to highlight because pre-review is an organization that is devoted to try to change um, the, the kind of structure of who is peer reviewing, making peer reviewing more accessible um, involving a uh, more diverse group of individuals in reviewing and uh, supporting that through the use of journal clubs uh, as well. So Review Commons um, is an experiment launched by ASAP Bio in conjunction with EMBO Press. So this uh, project, um, and I'll speak a little bit about how this relates to some of these other initiatives here, is a option if you want to submit to a journal in kind of a cell or um, cell biology, molecular biology space that, um, it, but you're also interested in reducing cycles of re-review, getting more constructive review, um, and perhaps in enhancing uh, transparency. So um, the, the motivation for this project um, is that there's been an estimated 15 million hours wasted every year on duplicate peer review. Um, this is, you know, especially in biomedical sciences, um, that on average, um, about half manuscripts require at more than one submission uh, in order to lead to acceptance. And so um, oftentimes, if this, if this uh, the manuscript is sent out for review and, and the reviews are either not constructive because they're a cursory dismissal of the paper um, uh, or you know, the, uh, the authors decide to uh, just move forward to another journal, those re reviewers can sometimes be contacted again um, without their uh, work taken into account. So Review Commons offers the option for authors to allow the peer reviews to be posted on BioArchive. So the authors choose to submit their preprint to the service. It gets reviewed by a um, professional, in a process organized by a professional editor at Embo Press in a journal agnostic fashion. And then the reviews are actually accessible on top of the BioArchive paper. And this 
provides readers with additional context and uh, I think demonstrates the transparency of peer review. So after this, the authors can then take their manuscript and submit it to one of 17 affiliate journals who have all agreed not to repeat peer review. Um, and we, I have a link to drop into the chat as well, um, have just evaluated the service. And um, I think that the, the rate of re-review is very low. And so we're quite pleased with this approach's ability to conserve that effort. Um, again, and you know, this is something where I would encourage you to check out this link if it interests you, but um, there are other wonderful initiatives like eLife's preprint review, um, peer of science, peer community in that are offering similar but slightly different approaches to these issues. And so it's very exciting to be um, a part of this ecosystem right now where there's so much experimentation on peer review preprints. Um, I think that one key question is that all of the services I just mentioned in the last slide um, have some sort of editor who is inviting the peer review. And I think that's one powerful strategy to encourage participation in peer review. But as you may have noticed on some of the previous graphs, the rate of commenting on bioarchive is, at, I should say, about 5 to 10% of manuscripts receive commenting. And those that do, there's a small number of, of papers that get a huge number of comments, like the one that I showed you on COVID-19. Um, but, you know, I think that uh, science would work much more robustly if we had a higher rate of public commenting on preprints in a substantive and constructive way. And so we're organizing an event next month and the month following. It's a design sprint um, uh, hosted in partnership with uh, some funders and publishers. We're trying to identify ways of encouraging more feedback on preprints. And so if this interests you, we invite you to either submit a proposal or just come and provide feedback and ideas. Um, really, I think also, you know, re people who are researchers, active researchers, is very uh, helpful and useful in this case because, li you know, librarians, really anyone I think who's interested in this, we, we need you to help us, um, you know, think through this very difficult problem. So just in the last couple of minutes, um, I want to speculate a little bit about what the future of preprints could look like and how that could benefit science even, even further. So going back to at the very beginning of the slides, I told you about Ron's study of the rate of publication. He also found that uh, the number of panels, so figure panels, in an individual paper in a variety of different journals was actually increasing more than threefold over this time period. Um, and especially when you include the supplemental material. So papers 30 years ago were much smaller than they are now. And I think that, that clearly it's now easier to, to generate data, it's certainly easier to make figures um, but I think a large uh, contributor to this delay in, in uh, publication is, and certainly been my experience, the concept of kind of saving up work to try to construct a very complete, comprehensive story. This um, is probably, in, in my opinion, one of the things that's slowing down science the most. Um, and we're seeing something that's actually quite different with COVID-19. Again, uh, going back to this uh, analysis, preprints that are relevant to COVID-19 are a little over half as long as preprints that are not relevant to COVID-19. They have fewer references and they're also updated uh, more frequently. So, you know, I think um, it's kind of surprising to see that the the rate of, of versioning is, um, you know, there's probably about a twofold increase in the the manuscripts that are increasing uh, two or more versions. So I think this this idea of versioning a manuscript is something that I have found incredibly useful. That I think is also the a tremendous uh, power of preprints. 
So for example, I just want to highlight this paper. <laughs> I just put out a call on Twitter a couple days ago about looking for uh, examples of, of papers like this. So this, uh, there's a version of this preprint posted in January 2020. Um, which was, I, I'm assuming, based upon the dates listed by the journal, around the same time it was submitted to a journal. Um, and you know, I think this represents the way that many people think about preprints in life sciences. That basically, and it, it's really also supported by the submission system of the journal, of the preprint server. But these authors had actually posted two other versions of the preprint. Um, so the version in January of 2020 had eight figures, but really almost a year earlier, they had posted a shorter version that was really visible and citable, and I think gained all of the benefits of preprinting, of being visible in infrastructure, being recognized by the community, but got the science out, the initial science that was ready, over a year earlier. And I think that this leads to the hypothetical question of if it were commonplace to preprint as soon as we had a solid single figure, how much time would be saved overall and how much, how much resources could we save? How much time and duplication of effort, how much more collaboration could we get started if we did this? Um, in fact, the, the infrastructure for this is really um, in place. You know, I think there's a lot of concern about multiple versions creating confusion, but uh, bioarchive and metaarchive support this really nice revision summary, which is a field of metadata where authors can describe how this version changes from previous ones. Um, and you know, I think, to my knowledge, this is not uh, being done by journals yet. Although some journals are linking backwards to the preprints, so I think that you know, really, there there is already support for this kind of usage of preprints. And if this were common, if this were widespread, and we were able to um, uh, enable the sharing of results earlier, you know, what what kind of implications would that have for uh, research as a whole? So um, with that, I just want to say thank you so much for your attention so far. I'm very much looking forward to any uh, questions or comments that you might have. Um, I'll uh, hopefully leave the slide up <laughs> a little bit so you can see uh, this uh, URL if you'd like to go take a look at the slides. Um, but uh, I really appreciate your attention and uh, thank you for uh, the invitation to speak today. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Jessica. It's really interesting. Um, and we've already actually had a question posted in the chat, which was, um, Jessica, do you have a sense of um, whether authors will still see publication in a journal as the, the final end goal of these processes? Um, and that was given kind of the context of some universities, uh, so universities still count published articles only. And I think that that means sort of in terms of their, um, uh, you know, employment and promotion cycles and and counting metrics you know internally within the university um, so you know universities are still only counting those published items but do you think that this is going to change over time as preprints become more and more acceptable yeah it's a great question i mean i think that there is so much reliance on uh, you know outsourcing if you will of evaluation of research to journals uh, this is a very ingrained i think part of uh, our culture at the moment and something that organizations like DORA, the Declaration on Research Assessment, are really working to, to change. Um, I think there is a question as to how, um, how we can create proxies of trust um, and signal interest in papers in a way that is more dynamic. Um, I think that journals uh, are currently playing an important role, not only in organizing peer review and in curating that work, but I think that it's possible to imagine other ways of performing those functions that don't result in, that are kind of uncoupled from publication, if you will. So, you know, I think there's a variety of, of different ways that uh, the current environment could evolve to perform these functions. So, for example, overlay journals, um, which don't you know, publish the article themselves, but that uh, 
basically signify that they have uh, kind of recommended or certified or validated a preprint. Um, there's also uh, the service peer community in, which is explicitly recommending papers. So, you know, there is this sort of shorthand signal for quality that they are, con you know, conveying, um, but it is not intended to be a replacement for journal publication. So I think that there is, um, I think that it, I think the question of how to uh, communicate trust and, uh, you know, certification, validation, whatever you want to call it, um, is something that is going to be needed in the future in one way or the other. Thanks. Um, and actually, I have a sort of a, a, an almost flip side to that question, I guess, which is, what do you think that the main negative consequences of increased preprint use might be and what can be done now to preemptively avoid those those possible negative consequences of, of increased preprint uh, pre use? Yeah, um, I, I think that there's a kind of fundamental anxiety about reducing the gatekeeping uh, toward the kind of publishing of scholarly research. Um, and I think that, you know, pre-printing, there, there's obviously uh, opportunities where, um, another key issue I think is how many, um, what, what is the screening process for preprints? Um, you know, for example, there have been some cases where uh, actually not on a preprint server, but on a general purpose repository, there have been papers that have, um, appeared that have allegedly been funded by Steve Bannon and, you know, contributed to conspiracy theories and so forth. So I think that, that there's, um, I, I feel like the, the solution to this is transparent labeling uh, of how all scholarly objects were, came to be on the internet, who has looked at them, you know, what kind of judgments have they made, uh, et cetera. I think that we need to move from a situation in which we are assuming that everything that looks like a research paper that's online mm -hmm. has been vetted by a, uh, a group of, uh, of independent experts. Um, and I think part of this includes um, a journal being more explicit about what their peer review process is as well. Um, I, I think that preprint use, one of, one of the things that I do uh, uh, worry about with preprints and um, is, is the fact that there is no journal name to kind of act to provide you know, a Matthew effect of if, a, if an article is published in a certain journal, it's likely to receive a lot of attention. Uh, and in that sense, I think preprints kind of reduce barriers to uh, sharing and disseminating work. But I think it's also very valid to be concerned about if preprints um, actually just promote people who are already well-known authors and established authors. Uh, so one of um, the great projects that um, a former colleague of mine, Amy Penfold, worked on is called Hidden Preprints, which is a, a, a server, excuse me, a search tool that specifically highlights preprints that are getting less attention. So how can we design systems that actively help to um, uh, promote more equity in the way attention is distributed on preprints. Um, so I was actually going to ask a follow-up question about transparency, but a really nice one just came up in the talk, which is almost the, the opposite of that. So a, a lot of these preprint processes are emphasizing transparency and making everything as open and viewable as possible. But of course, some um, areas of, of research, particularly in the, the social sciences, favor double blind peer review. Um, so how do you feel that, that um, preprint systems can, uh, can interface with that kind of um, community? Yeah, I mean, I really would love to hear from, <laughs> it's really, the, I think the experts were in the audience here, um, but, I think that, that certainly we interact with uh, different preprint servers who are grappling with this, this question. Um, my understanding um, is that uh, you know, the dissemination of a paper on a preprint server can potentially reduce the pool of reviewers who have not seen that paper and therefore would be compromised as double blind reviewers. 
Um, but it is certainly not the only way that that is already happening. Uh, so I think that there's you know, clearly a balance in between maintaining the integrity of um, the double-blind peer review process. And I think there's this expectation that reviewers you know, are not uh, supposed to be Googling for, for the paper and so forth. So um, to my knowledge, I don't know if there's been any um, studies on, on preprints and double-blind peer review. Um, but uh, I think that this is probably going to affect certain fields in different ways, depending on the size of the field. Uh, brilliant. And so actually, um, I'm quite interested in one of these other questions that was brought up here. Um, so you mentioned that, that some journals are linking back to the published, uh, to the preprint version of an article, even when they're presenting the published version online. And of course, sometimes you've got this in the opposite direction where um, uh, where the preprint server is linking forwards to the published version. Um, how well connected up are these systems in general at the moment? What are the big gaps in that ecosystem? Because I noticed one of the previous slides you had was about a big discussion that went on about a preprint article on Twitter. And is there any way in which that discussion on Twitter is in any way linked to that preprint if you were to just go and view that preprint? Yeah, this is a fantastic uh, question. And I think it's very important. Uh, from the perspective of not only directing attention from viewers, but also, you know, the question of pooling potentially citations on preprints in the published article, helping journalists identify experts that might want to talk to, etc. So, from the perspective of um, preprint relationship with the journal articles, um, so I think that there's a couple different layers to this question. The first is. Um, Crossref has the section in the metadata, which allows a preprint server to update their preprint uh, record with the DOI of the published version. Um, and this can be found oftentimes uh, by the preprint server. There's, I think, a service that Crossref also performs. So there's basically some kind of fuzzy matching where a proposed, uh, based upon title or author similarities, a similar manuscript might be found basically by an automated search. This process isn't perfect. Um, authors can also you know, email the preprint server or request this link to be either displayed or the record to be updated in Crossref. But some preprint servers also use a different DOI registry uh, data site, which to my knowledge doesn't have a similar feature. Um, and I, I should say that I think BioArchive does and MedArchive do a really nice job of um, making visible the different types of connections to the preprint. So they do list uh, tweets mention, mentioning this preprint. Um, but as the number of discussion sites proliferate, you now have comments in the, the comments in the comments of BioArchive, the hypothesis toolbar, um, tweets that are appearing, uh, links out to other blog posts and discussion sites. Uh, I think that there's um, other projects that are emerging that will hopefully provide a clearer picture of all of this information. Fantastic. I, and I think that we'll probably try and wrap up here just to make sure that people have time if they're going on to their next um, next meeting. I've just stuck in the chat uh, some useful links. So um, the uh, link to the workshop that's coming up straight after this and also a link to the, the full list of Australian uh, or Australasian rather Open Access Week events. Um, Jessica, would you be happy to also chuck your um, tiny URL into the chat window so that people have the um, uh, have that yes. clickable link? Yes, I certainly will. Thank you. There's obviously a stack of questions uh, still in that chat window that we didn't sadly get time to get around to. Um, but I'm sure that this is only the beginning of a much elongated conversation. And of course, you can find Jessica on Twitter and other social media to uh, rapid fire additional questions at her <laughs> um, for her whole Sunday night. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, it's been uh, great uh, to interact with you and, and these questions and uh, uh, best of luck with the rest of the workshop and the week. Thank you. Brilliant. Well, thank you, everybody. And I look forward to you all uh, coming along to additional talks throughout the rest of the week.